Uh, we want to say good morning to our Portage family and downtown and those who are joining us online. He is risen. Now listen, you can always tell half of our church comes from a traditional background, half from a charismatic background. Charismatics all hoot and holler when I say he's risen. It's like, woo! And the other half say, he is risen indeed. <laughs> so let's all practice it together. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And I just want to remind everyone this morning that we're not just worshiping here in Kalamazoo or in Southwest Michigan or even here in the United States. What began 2,000 years ago with just a handful of those who were his disciples waiting for him by the tomb has now turned into billions of worshipers on every continent, in every language, in every skin color, in every socioeconomic status. All around the world today, billions are celebrating and declaring he is is risen indeed. And it truly is our living hope. It's the hope of the world. And so we're so glad you're here with us this morning. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to open it with me to Mark chapter 16. If you don't have a Bible, it's going to come up on the screens here in a moment. You can follow along there. But the title of my Easter message this morning is The Women, the Disciples, and Peter. The women, the disciples, and Peter. You know, every year, while you're turning there, every year, this is the 27th year that Jane and I have had the privilege of leading Radiant Church from its very beginning to what it is today. And that means 27 Easter messages. And every year, I'm looking at the story of Easter, the resurrection of Jesus, like looking at the most perfect, beautiful diamond. It has so many different facets to it, so many different angles to it. And I always pray and I always ask the Lord, Lord, what direction do you want me to go with telling the story today? And this year when I was studying in Mark 16, which is the shortest of all four of the Gospels accounts of the resurrection, the Lord highlighted something that I'll, I'll show you here in a moment. But read with me beginning in verse number one. It says, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back, and it was very large. And entering into the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen, and he is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and they fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. You'll notice that when the angel, this is described as a young man sitting on the right side where Jesus' body had laid, speaks to the women on that first resurrection, that first Easter morning, he tells them, go tell his disciples and Peter and Peter, that he is going before them and will meet them in Galilee. This is significant. Because in this story, what we realize is that right along with all of the Holy Week, from his triumphal entry and shouts of coronation of a king, and then on Good Friday with the shouts of crucify him as a criminal, and Saturday of waiting and trying to figure out what was taking place, this has affected the women, the disciples, but it's affected Peter in a way that's different from all the others. You see, the women were deeply devoted to Jesus. Here they are on the other side of the Sabbath where they can finally go and they can visit 
Jesus' grave. And their hopes and their anticipations is, is that the Roman centurions or somebody that are there posting guard over the tomb will allow them to go in so that they can care for Jesus' body and anoint him and more fully prepare his body. Why? Because they love Jesus. They've traveled with Jesus. They've supported Jesus. They've been on the outer fringe, but they have been some of the closest companions of Jesus, and they're deeply committed. And the other disciples, they are discouraged and they're in the throes of despair. I mean, for two days, imagine all of their hopes and all their dreams and everything that they've said yes to following Jesus for for three years is now dead and lying behind the stone in a tomb with Jesus over Friday and Saturday. But then there's Peter. And Peter is different from the other disciples. And he's different for one reason. It's that Peter is the disciple who is the most likely to succeed. When you think about Peter being called by Jesus as one of the first disciples, he's the leading disciple. He's that guy who's the most likely to succeed. I don't know if any of you remember the days, maybe they still do it, but they used to pass out yearbooks in school. Like, you know, you graduated. And I graduated in 1989. I don't have my yearbook anymore. I got rid of it uh, because I didn't want any evidence of my mullet existing. And so I got rid of it years ago. I wish I still kind of had it. Uh, there's some things in there. But, you know, in yearbooks, I don't know if they do that anymore, but it was kind of fun because, you know, you graduate and everybody signs it and stay cool, man, and, you know, whatever, and you never see those people again. But it's great because that was the original way we used to cancel people. You know, today, you just unfollow them on social media. Back in the day, you just cross their face out or you put, like, a mustache on them or horns on them, and that was how you did it in, in yearbooks. But in the yearbook, there was always... This group of people, there was the valedictorian, the salutatorian, and then the most likely to succeed. How many remember that? There were, in, in our class, there was a kid named Travis Gates, straight A student, played three sports, and he was sharp looking, and he was nice, which, I mean, he was kind of nice to everybody. He wasn't, he was in the cool crowd, but he was nice to everybody, and he was like, he was good at everything. He like helped me with my math homework one day, and I was just a, you know, I was just a young, he was a couple years older than I was. Uh, I was young, I was a sophomore, he was a senior. He was on his way to West Point to be a military officer. I mean, straight A student, I mean, everything. Most likely to succeed. And then there's always the other categories, most likely to surprise their parents, or most likely to end up in jail, or something like that, I don't know. <laughs> Peter is, out of all the disciples, the most likely to succeed. Think about his pedigree. His original name is Simon, which means he can hear. That's a high bar. But Jesus says, no, your name for now on is going to be Peter, Petros, which means rock. Jesus literally changes his name to Rocky. Because <laughs> he's a fisherman. He's a small business owner. He's a Take the bull by the horns. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. He's blue collar. He's got calluses on his hands. He's a natural leader. Type A. And Jesus said, no, I'm going to call you the rock. You're firm. You're strong. You're Peter. You're confident. Think about this. Jesus actually said to Peter one day in Matthew 16, he says to him, when he's asking the question, who do people say that I am? The disciples all said, well, Jesus, some say that you're a prophet and some say that you're, you know, like Moses or you're Elijah or one of, one of those. And he says, but who do you say that I am? And, you know, in a Q&A with Jesus, nobody wants to get it wrong. But Peter steps forward and he says, I'll tell you who you are. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who's in heaven. Can't you just see Peter in that moment with his arms folded looking at the other guys going, see, look at that. <laughs> look who got that one right. And Jesus then goes on to say, and upon this rock, it's a play on his name, Petros, upon the rock of this revelation that came from this man named Rock, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I mean, Peter had everything going for him in Matthew 17. When Jesus goes up on the mountain of transfiguration and he's going to reveal his glory, who he really is. 
Peter's there. Peter's there. Peter sees Jesus for who he really is. He's one of the three, Peter, James, and John, who are closest to Jesus. But when Jesus tells the disciples in Matthew 26 that he's about to go and to be handed over into the hands of the religious leaders, that he's going to be crucified, but that he's going to rise again and he's going to meet them in Galilee. Peter says to Jesus, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the other disciples then said the same thing. But, but Peter said, Lord, I will never deny you. I am with you. I will die with you. I will take a bullet for you. Most likely to succeed. But on the other side of the cross, we realize that Peter is actually the one who's failed him most. Nobody's failed Jesus. Nobody's betrayed Jesus short of Judas more than Peter. Matthew 26, in the last hours of Jesus's life, he takes his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane where he's praying and he's interceding. He's crying out to God, God, give me the, Father, give me the grace that I need to go to the cross. Not my will, but yours be done. And he tells the disciples, I need you to stay here and I need you to pray with me, pray for me while I'm over here, getting what I need to be able to do what God's called me to do. He says, pray, and yet Jesus comes back, and what does he find? He finds Peter has fallen asleep in his greatest hour of need. When the guards finally come into the garden to arrest Jesus, when it's all about ready to kick in, and Jesus is about ready to be arrested, beaten, falsely accused, scourged, spit upon, mocked, ridiculed, stripped naked, forced to carry his cross, and crucified. When it all begins in the garden, and the guards come in, and they're looking for Jesus, and they go to arrest him, Peter throws everything Jesus has taught him out the window about loving your neighbors, about walking in the spirit and not in the flesh, and he pulls out his sword, and he slices off the ear of one of the guards named Malchus. How do we know Jesus wasn't happy with that? Because Jesus picks the ear back up and he puts it back on and he heals the man. Think of the fact that Jesus is about to go to the cross and he cares enough about his enemy to pick up an ear and to heal it. But Peter's failed him yet again. And ultimately he runs for his life. After he watches Jesus heal this man, he just runs. He books it just like all the other disciples who in Jesus's greatest moment of need, when they should have stood with him, they flee for their lives. And Peter does. Peter runs away. And Jesus is taken. And as they're standing outside of the place where they've taken Jesus, and they're accusing him and trying him illegally and about ready to sentence him to death. Peter, standing outside, denies Jesus. Denies even knowing him. Not once, not twice, but three times. Not to somebody with a gun to his head, but to a young woman next to a fire. And he actually even curses Jesus. He says, I do not know the man. Stop asking me. And the Bible says in Matthew 26, in verse 75, and Peter, at that moment, remembered the saying of Jesus when Jesus had just told him, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter failed Jesus on a scale that none of the other disciples came even close. And while they're all trying to figure out what has just happened, their hopes, their dreams, their confidence has all been dashed. The women come on Sunday morning back from an empty tomb and they tell the disciples and Peter. He's alive and he said he's gonna meet you in Galilee. So in the days after the crucifixion and the resurrection, 
What does Peter, the most likely to succeed, the leader of the disciples, what does he do? He goes back home. He goes back to Galilee. He's not hanging out in Jerusalem. He goes back to Galilee. And in fact, he goes back to the only thing that he knows to do, that he has any confidence in, because he has felt the sting of his betrayal of Jesus more than anybody. And you know, what do we do in the moments of our greatest shame, in the moments of our greatest guilt? When we failed the most, when we've blown it, when we've come up short, what do we do in those moments? We go back to the very things where we're confident. We go back to the things that we know are for sure. We go home. We go to our rooms. We do the things that we know we can achieve. We know that we can succeed at. Why? Because we've lost confidence in everything else. And we, we go back home because that's where we remember who we are. We go back home. We go back to our first places because that's where our confidence lies. And that's what Peter does. Peter goes back to Galilee. And John, in his gospel, in John chapter 21, gives us the account of what happens when they go back. It says in John 21, beginning in verse 3, it says, And they went out, all the disciples and they got into the boat because Peter said, let's go fishing. And it says, and they caught nothing. And just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast your net then on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And so they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, and that's him rubbing it in on Peter. The disciple that Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garments, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea and the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about 100 yards off. And when they got out onto land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. And so Simon Peter went aboard, hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now this is an astonishing, an astonishing moment in how Jesus, the resurrected son of the living God, comes to them. He doesn't come to them in their Jerusalem, which is the place of scandal, shame, guilt, their worst moments. He comes to them. He comes to Peter in Galilee, their first place. He comes to them in the place where Jesus had called them, Jesus had trained them, and for Peter, where Jesus had named him. That's where Jesus comes. Jesus travels to their first place. I, I want you to think for a second about maybe your first place. The first place you've ever encountered God. The first place where you've ever experienced Jesus and his grace. The first time you ever heard the gospel and it really penetrated you. Maybe today is that first day for you. Maybe this church service is your first place. For me, I could take you in a car if we had the time and I could drive you to the east side of the state to a place that's now a strip mall, but at one time was a small little church with about 50 members called Good Shepherd Assembly of God. And on August 11th, 1983, Jesus encountered me as a 12-year-old boy in this place. And I've never forgotten it. This was Peter's first place. This was, if you go back and you remember Luke chapter 5, where Jesus first called Peter. It was at this exact spot. And it was an exact similar circumstance. Peter, the professional fisherman, had been out all night and caught nothing. 
And then, you know, this rabbi who was teaching in town named Jesus comes strolling over the hill and down with the crowds following him down to Peter's boat. Peter has pulled his boat up on the shore. He caught nothing all night. He wants to clean his nets and go home and go to sleep. A night full of failure. And Jesus steps into his boat and he tells Peter, Peter, will you push off and push out a little ways from land so that I can use your boat and preach? And Peter being the nice guy that he is, he does it. And then the moment where Jesus said to, G to Peter, Peter, launch out into the deep. Put up your sails and go back out to the middle of the lake for a catch. And in his first encounter with Jesus, Peter had told him, Lord, I've worked all night long and didn't catch anything. I'm a fisherman, you're not. I know when it's time to fish, this is the worst time. But he says, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the nets. And he did it. And on that first occasion, three years earlier, he caught such a big load that it began to sink his own boat. And James and John had to bring their boats over and they filled both boats. And in that moment, something broke in Peter and he said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to Peter in that first encounter, from now on, you're not going to be a fisherman. From now on, I'm going to teach you to fish for men. You're going to be a fisher of men. And he left his nets and he followed Jesus and his life had completely changed. He never thought he would go back there. He never thought he would ever see those boats and those nets ever again. But here he is in the moment of his worst failure, his worst betrayal. He's done the unthinkable to God and unto Jesus. And he's back out on the same boat in the same lake and he has the same failure. And that's where Jesus comes to him. And when he comes to Peter's first place, on another night marked by nothing but failure, what does he say to Peter? Peter, have you caught anything? Nothing. Doesn't surprise me. But what's Jesus doing? Jesus, this blows my mind. Jesus, who's been raised from the dead, that's a pretty good victory makes breakfast. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, Jesus, my wife won't even make breakfast. It's like, but Jesus, <laughs> but Jesus is making breakfast. Jesus had to show up there, make a fire. He had to catch a fish. Peter hasn't caught anything. Jesus just goes, poop. I don't know if that happens. He just like stuck out his hand and like, whoop, or, or if he like threw a line in or what, or how that goes. He has a fire. He makes bread. He's cooking. And he says to the disciples, come and have breakfast. Jesus, when he comes to Peter and his disciples after their worst betrayal, after their failures, Jesus cares for them. He could have judged them. He could have condemned them. He could have ignored them. He could have left them behind. But he comes to them and he serves them breakfast. I've thought about it. Why, why did Jesus do this? It's because there's something about the way that Jesus loves us and serves us. Even when we've blown it. Even when we feel like we're disqualified and God shouldn't care about us. And the meal that Jesus makes for Peter and the disciples is not lunch, it's not dinner, it's breakfast because breakfast is the first meal of a new day. And what Jesus was saying is, I know you've blown it. Peter, I know you've messed up. I know you've betrayed me, but I have not forgotten you and I have not left you behind. In fact, I've come to serve you and I'm gonna feed you what you can't feed yourself and I'm gonna provide for you what you and your own strength can't provide for yourself. And I'm declaring to you, today is a new day and a new beginning. And I am Lord of new beginnings. Jesus feeds him. This, I believe, is the first time for Peter that he has ever understood grace. Remember, Peter's the most likely to succeed. Peter's used to making it happen. 
Peter's used to the strength of his own hand, his own intellect, his own ability, his charisma. He's used to all of those type of things. But now, in one moment, he's being confronted at the worst moment of his life, when he's turned his back on Jesus, when he's denied even knowing him. Jesus comes to him and serves him and gives him what he could never, ever do on his own. And you know what? That's exactly how Jesus comes to each and every one of us. It's the true story of Easter. It's not just what he did, it's why he did it. Jesus died for the sins of all of us because all of us have, like sheep, gone astray each in our own way. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have betrayed God. All of us have have failed in our best attempts at being righteous, at being good, We have our own agenda and we go in our own direction and we get offended at God and we say, God, later. But just like he came to Peter, he comes to us to remind us that our failures do not disqualify us, that that is why Jesus went to the cross. There's something else. Did you, did you notice how John captures this? He's like, so we pulled the nets in. These huge, the nets were overflowing, and it had 153 fish, big fish. For a long time, I've read, read that and thought to myself, why do they mention 153? There's something about 153. And so I've gone back and read like what church fathers have said for 2,000 years, Luther, Augustine, John Chrysostom, Thomas Aquinas, and even some of the earlier church fathers. And and you know what? If you go back, you can read a whole bunch of conjecture. They're like, if you read the prophetic scripture of Isaiah, and you multiply that by uh, by 28 chapters in the book of Matthew, and divide it by the year 33 AD, you come up with 153. Or if you take like 66 books in the Bible, multiply it by the lion's winning record, and subtract (laughs) the number of Reese's peanut butter eggs that Pastor Lee has eaten over this weekend, it will equal 153. None of that's the reason. The reason why John includes 153 fish is because this moment marked them. And in moments that mark us, we remember every detail. Remember where you were when you met the person that you're married to. Remember where you were on 9-11. Some of you may be old enough to remember where you were when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Some of you might remember where you were when we put a man on the moon. You remember defining moments in your life, and you remember every detail about them. And John and Peter and James and the other disciples are like, we remember that day when Jesus was cooking us breakfast, and we had failed, we couldn't catch anything, and yet he says, Throw our nets on the other side, and we did it. It was like a replay of our calling to follow him the first time. And we pulled the nets in, and there was 153 large fish, and yet the nets did not break. Jesus gave them 153 reasons to believe. When in reality, Peter at least had 153 reasons in his own mind why God should never forgive him, why his call was done, why he needed to return back to fishing. But what is pictured here is that even though there were 153 large fish, it says the nets did not break. And you know what that's a picture of? The nets are a picture of God's grace. You might have failed and betrayed God 153 times, times 153, but God's grace, the net does not break. Why? Because where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And no matter how badly we've lived our lives, no matter how hard we've tried to be good and to please God, no matter how many times we failed him or betrayed him, maybe you prayed a prayer as a kid, maybe you grew up in church and you've wandered away, maybe you've explored the world, maybe you've thought that there's multiple different different ways, and over and over and over again, you have failed, and you feel the shame and the guilt and the remorse of it, and we want to distance ourselves and go back to what we're confident in, and yet Jesus comes to us, and he's prepared for us what we could never prepare for ourselves, and he looks at maybe 153 different reasons 
that we've given ourselves why God should be done with us. And he says to us, the net of my grace is stronger than the weight of your sin. The gravity of your failure is not stronger than the victory of Easter. Just as he came to Peter, he comes to us. And today, on this Easter Sunday, I want you to know that it doesn't matter whether you identify with the women, you say, I'm deeply devoted to Jesus. Or you identify with the disciples in despair and doubt, questions, or Peter. Jesus is alive. Jesus loves you. And nothing that you do is stronger than the victory that Jesus won when he rose from the dead. If he can save Peter, if he can save the women, if he can save the disciples, if he can restore them back, there's nothing that you have done that can break the net of his grace. It is stronger, more powerful than anything you've ever done. I want you to stand with me in this room, if you would, and wherever you're at joining us, if you would stand to your feet. And I want to pray with us, and I'm going to ask, please, if you would take the next two moments and not move. This is a sacred, it's a holy moment. It's a time for us to respond to God's grace. And I just ask you to bow your heads and to close your eyes with me. Today, I know that a lot of us may become on an Easter Sunday we can identify with Peter. Maybe for some of us, we're just like, you know what? They're, my background, I grew up in church. I even prayed a prayer one time and when I was a child or a teenager and invited Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. But just like in this story, life got complicated. And I've wandered. I feel like maybe I failed God. I feel like I've done too much to ever be restored. I wouldn't even know where to begin. Or maybe you would say, I just, I feel the burden, the weight of, of guilt and shame where it's like, I love God. I just don't even know where to start, how to re-engage that relationship with him. Or maybe today you're listening and you're just like, you know, I've never understood grace. I've always thought, Believed in God, I believed in Jesus, but I thought I had to be good enough for him to accept me. I never understood that he actually came because I couldn't do it. And he did for me what I could not do for myself and that I truly need to be saved by grace just by receiving the gift of salvation. I've never understood that, but today, today I understand. Today, I know that. Listen, it doesn't matter whether you've never done it or whether today you feel like you're just far away from God because of circumstances or like Peter, because maybe you're thinking of some great failure that you have allowed to separate you from God. I want you to know that today, Jesus, the one who rose from the dead, he's come here today to rescue and to restore you to give you a new beginning, to cook breakfast for you that announces a new day and a new beginning, a clean conscience, a clean slate, forgiveness of sins and eternal life. That just like he lives forever, those who believe in him and put their trust in him will live forever. And today I wanna give you an opportunity today that just like Peter, it's an opportunity for you to receive God's grace, to say, God, I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? Will you restore me? Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me and give me a brand new beginning. Today, he's here to do that. Today, he will save. The Bible says, if anyone calls upon the name of the Lord, anyone, he will be saved. Today, he doesn't need you to perform. He doesn't need you to qualify. He just needs you to acknowledge that he is Lord, that you are a sinner, and that you turn your heart towards him. And today, he will give you everything that you need to be made right before God. You just have to acknowledge him. And today, all over this room, I'm gonna ask you in just a moment, that if you're here and you know you're not right with God, but you say, today I wanna get right with God. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer, but I want you to take the first step. If you know you're not right with God, today you need a new beginning. 
You need to be restored. I'm gonna count to three in just a moment, and when I say three, if that's you, and you today wanna make Jesus Lord of your life, or you wanna get right, and you are asking him to restore you like he did Peter, to a new first beginning, I'm gonna ask you when you hear me say three to raise your hand all over this room and say, today I'm choosing Jesus. Today I'm coming home. And then we're gonna pray together. So get ready, here we go. One, two, three. Raise your hand all over the room and you will not be alone. Hold it up all over the room. If you've not raised your hand, raise it right now. Come on, you're not alone. Yes, 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 yes. Say today I'm getting right with God. Jesus, restore me, restore the joy. Restore my relationship with you. Jesus, save me, forgive me. If you've not raised it, I'm gonna wait 10 seconds. This is your moment, raise it right now. Hands all over the room. I see your hand. You can put those hands down. Thank you, I want everybody to look up at me. I'm gonna ask you to do one more thing. This is radical, but this is church. When Peter realized it was Jesus, it says he jumped out of the boat and he swam to Jesus because he wasn't indifferent. He's like, yes, I wanna get to Jesus. I'm gonna ask you to do something radical that marks this moment like Peter's jumping in the water marked his moment forever. I'm gonna ask you if you raised your hand, I wanna pray with you, but I want you to swim for sure. I want you to right now, Get out of your seat to the nearest aisle and meet me right down here. And we're gonna pray together today, right down here. You come, come from every direction. Come on, don't delay, don't wait. Just come right down here. Just come from wherever you are. Come on, swim, swim for shore. Swim for Jesus. Come from wherever you're at. Over here, over there. Let's welcome them. Come on, there's more that are coming. This, Sir, God bless you. Young lady, God bless you. Come on, don't be denied, this is your moment. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Come on, young lady, there's more right here. Come on, come from every direction. You might say, it's too hard to get to the aisle. Come on, it's worth it. Today, it's worth it. Come, God bless you. Ma'am, God bless you. To all of you who just walked down, that was maybe the most difficult walk you've ever made, but you will never forget it. And I'm gonna ask real quickly, thank you, young man. Come on, can we just welcome this young man who just took that step? The coming young ladies. Church, I just feel like we gotta wait one more moment. I feel like right now there's a handful of people who are on the fence like, oh, I don't need to go down there to make this count. You don't have to, but you should. Because it will mark that moment. Right now there's some people wrestling with whether to do it. Come on, break out of that barrier and you come right now. Come on, we'll wait. Just 30 seconds. Come on, we'll wait. Right over here. God bless you. Here we go. Come on, young man. Thank you, young lady. Listen, to those of you who came down, listen, the Bible says this. It says that if we believe in our heart on the Lord Jesus and we confess with our mouth that he is Lord, we will be saved. That God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So I'm just gonna lead you in a prayer. Everybody in this room is gonna pray it with us. And when we say amen, your life is going to change just like Peter's. Are you ready? Everybody, I want you to join in this prayer as well. Say, Heavenly Father, I come in Jesus' name. And I confess, Jesus is Lord. He died on the cross. He was raised from the dead. And he is alive forevermore. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of every sin. And give me a new heart. From this day forward, I am a follower of Jesus. I am a child of God. God is my Father. Heaven is my home, and I will never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, church.